I'd like to welcome everyone. We're excited that you have all joined us for this session at Inspire on brokering information by Community Lifelines. My name is Terry Martin with NAPSIG Foundation. I, along with my colleagues, Charlotte Abel and Jared Doak, will be facilitating this session. We'll be monitoring the Q&A in the chat, so please feel free to ask your questions using that Q&A button in your toolbar and share those resources and thoughts in the chat. We really do look forward to your engagement and contributions to add to this conversation. So while we are virtual this year, we are thrilled that we get to bring together thought leaders and innovators from across the country. It was an extremely busy 2020 for our mission partners and things have not yet slowed down. So I did wanna just briefly uh, thank our speakers who like many of you are busy with COVID and other responses in their agencies for taking the time to share their work and experience with us. So here is the agenda for our session. We'll hear from Austin McMillan on the Houston Regional Catastrophic Preparedness Program and recent events that have tested their lifelines. We have Zach Stanford uh, who will presenting on their focus in Oklahoma on, on automating data from uh, the community lifelines and recent successes of private public partnerships from Tom Moran and the All Hazards Consortium with Stacey Neal with Virginia's Department of Emergency Management. And lastly, we are so very grateful and excited to have Chris Bond, Geospatial Information Officer for FEMA, who will be helping to moderate our session. In his current role, he has led organizational change, established an integrated geospatial workforce across the agency, and is advancing innovative technologies within the emergency management community. Chris also serves as the Chief of the Response Geospatial Office, which delivers policy guidance and training for the FEMA geospatial enterprise. Um, since joining FEMA in 2010, Chris has provided crisis decision support for more than 250 incidents, ranging from earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, wildfires, tornadoes, and pandemics. Mr. Vaughn has a Master of Science in Counseling Psychology and a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from Lee University. He is a graduate of American University's Key Executive Leadership Certificate Program, as well as Harvard University's National Preparedness Leadership Initiative Executive Education Program. So Chris is no stranger to this community. Many of you know him because he's so active and passionate about this mission. So I'm not gonna steal your thunder anymore, Chris. I'll turn it over to you uh, and so you can share how you're pulling double duty today and get us going with the conversation on the community lifeline. So over to you, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Terry. And thanks everybody for dialing in. We've got a really good uh, participant rate here. Um, over 130 participants so far. So once again, thanks so much to, uh, first of all, my esteemed colleagues and panelists, uh, to the NAPSIG Foundation for um, helping us host this, what I think is a, a critical discussion topic. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited for today's um, discussion. I'm, I'm also really excited to get some uh, participant feedback. Um, you're gonna hear some great panelists and, and uh, they're coming from across uh, the community um, from a, a local level, from an interagency level, from a state level. Obviously, we're trying to spin it from a federal level. Uh, so hopefully, you're going to hear a, a wide range of participation. Uh, as Terry mentioned, I am pulling double duty. So I, you're, I'm, I'm, I'm joining you today from Buffalo, currently supporting the uh, Community Vaccination Center effort here. So uh, we are living one of the lifelines today, that being the um, health and medical lifeline. And so I've got a lot of experience in, you know, seeing how data and data analytics, especially as it relates to the community lifelines, really play out in, in real time, especially as we're trying to figure out where to best in place resources, in this case, a community vaccination center, uh, and how that decision was made um, to make sure that we're, we're hitting the right population uh, to get uh, critical resources. So. With that, I'm going to do a very quick overview of the community lifelines. But before I do that, sorry, quick poll. Uh, we do want to just get a sense. Uh, we don't want to take for granted that people uh, across the board know about the community lifelines. Uh, and so we just kind of want to get a sense that help our panelists understand where we need to kind of tailor the message today. And it may even help us identify um, some additional questions that we can ask at the end of this presentation. So. Let's get into it now. I'm going to pause. You're starting to uh, see some of the uh, questions out here. We'll just take a quick pause and see how you guys are, uh, your familiarity with the lifelines. 
Looks like a couple more are still adding in, but I could see some trends here. Chris, uh, we have a lot in the somewhat familiar, which is great. And a lot in the planning and starting to implement. So hopefully with uh, the presentations you hear today, you'll get some great ideas of what's working well. Uh, it's kind of the whole point, right, of these sessions is to learn from each other. So I think this is a great uh, mix of folks. I'll go ahead and end the poll. Very good. Thank you so much for participating. I hope that helps our speakers as well understand who has joined us today. Great, so back, back over to me. Thanks, Terry. Yeah, we'll, we'll use the results of that poll and, and hopefully uh, tailor, tailor some of the questions there at the end. Uh, but let me first, for those that are not uh, familiar with the lifelines, it seems like a number of us are somewhat familiar. So let me just give you my own personal take on uh, how we got here. So um, I started at FEMA in 2010. So I've been at FEMA 11 years. Um, and I've seen us go through a number of iterations of trying to identify what data is needed, when and where, at what time, by whom, all that kind of stuff. I, I think specifically for the geospatial community coming out of Hurricane Katrina, there was a, a specific push for something called uh, the, the Homeland Security Geospatial Concept of Operations. And so if you've been in and around the emergency management GIS community for uh, any, you know, a while, you'll remember that referred to as the GeoConops. And, and I thought that was a really good start um, back, you know, in the early 2005s. And then um, there's been a, a lot of effort related to the National Response Framework, which really breaks things out by emergency support function. There's 15 ESFs, just kidding. There's 14. Now we added the, the, the other one back. So we've got 15 again. And so that's kind of gone back and forth. And then uh, in the early 2010s, 2011, 2012, we had things like um, the whole community. So PPD8, and that had core functions. And so the emergency management community has really been trying for years to try to define what it is that information and data that we're looking for for a, a really long time. Um, and, and so when it came to 2017, the Hurricane Harvey, Maria, and Irma, Harvey, Irma, Maria uh, incident response, um, we were basically still going after the NRF and the emergency support functions against those 15 different themes. And senior leadership took a step back after Harvey, Irma, Maria and asked, is there a better way for us to go after in information? And that's really when the community lifeline concept was born. Uh, it broke it out against these seven lifeline components. Um, you see the symbols there, but I'll, I'll try to give you a real quick overview of them. So uh, power, communications, transportation, hazardous materials, food, water, sheltering, health and medical and safety and security. So those are the seven main lifelines. And then they have components under each one of those. And, and we're gonna cover a lot of those elements during today's discussion. So if you're not familiar with the seven lifelines, you don't really know what we're talking about. It's really, if you could think about it in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I need transportation to get to a hospital. I need to know that that hospital is operational from a power perspective. I need to be able to call 911. Um, I need to know that I can uh, safely get there without having to go through some sort of hazardous material. And, and if I've lost my home, I need a place to go get food, water, and shelter. So they're all very much interrelated. There's a lot of interdependencies. We're going to talk a lot about interdependencies. Um, and the way that we're using uh, the lifelines at FEMA, at least, is, is really trying to track stabilization throughout the duration of an incident. We know we're going to get hit. We know we're going to get, um, uh, we're going to have to respond to an incident of national significance. Destabilization is going to occur across any one of those lifelines. But how do we really uh, partner with the private sector, with our state, local, uh, county, tribal, territorial partners? to gather the right information that we need in order to properly adjudicate resources. And that's what 99% of all of this is about. It's a way of thinking about uh, incident stabilization, 
collecting the data we need to make resource adjudication decisions quickly. So next slide, please. All right, I just, I just covered a lot of that, right? So um, in a response, you need to make quick, decisive decisions. And most of the time you're making those decisions with less than perfect data. Um, at least my bosses are okay with less than perfect data. But of course, the more information you have, the more it's uh, standardized, the more you can help with decision support. And so once again, it's all about the prioritization and the stable, you know, the prioritization on things that are starting to destabilize. So if you think about the different lifelines and if the power goes down, what is the relationship to communication or to transportation? And, and, and it's really all about cascading effects. If you can backwards engineer, if I can get this one portion, this one subcomponent of this transportation lifeline or this power lifeline back up and operational, it helps the rest of them because everything really is interdependent. Next slide, please. All right, how are we in implementing? Next slide. All right, so it really based, based on these three things and I've briefly covered some of this already. Um, it's really about situational awareness. And that is a nebulous, arguably vague term, uh, situational awareness. Everybody is trying to get situational awareness. Uh, in fact, it's one of FEMA's primary missions under ESF-5. There I go again, talking about the National Response Framework. So it's everybody's mission to try to gather as much information as possible. What we're seeing really in the geospatial community is a really good advent of how information is being reported. Um, one could arguably look back to things like in 2009, we really saw a major push for restful services and you really started to see the science and academic communities, more importantly, the science communities, uh, that being NOAA, NASA, USGS, really starting to push out that incident uh, awareness from a situational awareness perspective out as open public restful services. And then you just started the, this explosion of public facing web applications and maps. And that really helped kind of kickstart um, the push for public information. Um, what we're trying to do, at least part of the conversation we're hoping to have today is how do we actually start to curtail or, and, and I'm stealing some of my full slides later, how do we start to really focus in on those components and subcomponents and start to standardize information reporting to help with situational awareness. Number two is event characterization. We're, we're trying to move away from static reporting. And I think for years, uh, one of the, one, once again, a large uh, program within the geospatial community, something known as Hope Highfield Homeland Infrastructure Foundation level data. They do a really good job of providing static information on hospitals, fire stations, nursing homes, police stations, but we don't get that operational knowledge of whether or not that hospital is operational or not. Um, and so that's part of this whole discussion too. It's nice to know where the hospital is. It's nice to know where that wastewater treatment plant is, but where, you know, is that hospital actually operational? And so that's part of what you're seeing here. Um, uh, this is an example that has been developed over the last six months or so uh, at FEMA headquarters in partnership with our U.S. Coast Guard colleagues, where they're using a crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing editor app um, to empower a, a non-GIS uh, desk analyst to give us the status of a port uh, uh, status that's coming from the Coast Guard. Now, arguably, that information is actually out there in the public sphere already. There's something that the U.S. Coast Guard manages called Home Port, um, but it's it's not really GIS ready. And so this is a good way of taking that same content, putting it into a workflow that then enables that publicly available, open, restful interface that we can use, that the states can use, that the private sector can use. And that's really what a lot of the conversation should uh, be about. And hopefully that's what we're gonna talk to uh, today. Um, you're starting to see a lot of other things. The third point here, is decision support tools that are also coming out. And, and one could argue that that's planning factors. If I know the status of a port, if I know how many people are likely without power for a specific duration or estimated um, restoration times, how many resources do I need to send and where? And that's, that's to me, that's, that's a lot of where the focus 
uh, is and should should be. And technology can get us there if we can focus in on the right information at the right time to the right person. Um, one quick comment on this before we move on. I don't want to sugarcoat any of this and, and say that uh, we're really far down this pathway. I would argue that we really only have five to six or maybe seven nationally available, publicly available data sets. Some of the partners on the, on the panel today uh, are going to show you some examples of things that are working really, really well. But I think as a community, we have a long way to go. Uh, I think the emergency management community writ large has a long way to go to define the subcomponents and even beyond that of what data we need and then how do we actually implement that. That's some of my slides coming up. Next slide. Yeah, so I just, sorry, I keep skipping ahead. I'm so excited. I keep skipping ahead on some of these. So, um, you know, what's the periodicity? How often do we need that re reported? Is it every day? Is it twice a day? Is it every 15 minutes? I think that answer varies depending on the echelon that you're sitting at. If you're at a, a, a local EOC, if you're at a state EOC or, or on up the chain, it, you know. So we're, we're trying to define what those critical information nodes are, how it's going to be reported, the time and the standard. Next slide. I think that's the slide I'm really looking for, which is how to get to standard schemas. Ew, I keep skipping. So um, I'm a little out of order, so forgive me. So FEMA is pushing this out, right? And so there's a whole bunch of resources out there for those that are not familiar. I think we just put it up in the chat session. Um, if you look in you know, FEMA.gov, if you look up community lifelines, lifeline implementation toolkits, there's a number of resources that are out there. There's more coming, I would assume. Um, actually, let me take that last step back. There's, there's a number of resources out there for you right now. Um, we, at least in the geospatial world, are doing everything we can to empower this concept through publicly available uh, dashboards and data. Uh, in fact, if you go to any of our, um, uh, you know, our, our hub pages, we're doing everything we can to tag things by lifeline. One could argue that that is our ontology. And so we're trying to do everything we can to promulgate and promote this concept. I, I just really feel like it's, 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 it's going to help us, especially into the hurricane season and, and forth. So let me get to the next slide. Please let this be what I'm looking for. It's not. Next slide. Next slide. That's what I'm looking for. That's the slide I'm looking for. Thank you so much. So for me, it's all about standardization, right? What's the timeline? What's the, you know, what are you looking for? How do you want it reported? What's those data standard schemas? And if you have that really well articulated, you don't overthink it, and you empower the folks that have the information with the tech, the right tools and technology, you know, life, life is so much easier. And so um, uh, that's, I think, the vision that we're all trying to get towards is how to really empower the people that have it. And we've, the geospatial community has said this for years, locals have all the information, but how do you report that uh, in near real time? Obviously a, a desire for, for many of this is a, a national live automated web service. Unfortunately, those are very few and far between. I think we're giving an example here of ways not to pick on any one group or pick somebody out. Um, but how do you really identify and promote nationally available automated data services and features? And so I'm so excited to actually turn this over to some of our panelists today because they're living it. They're living it from a local, county, state, a private sector perspective. And so um, we are all in this together. I think we are we are very much open and want to get this conversation started. Once again, I really do thank NAPSIG for uh, helping us have this conversation today. So uh, next slide. I think that's it. Yeah, so I'm going to do a quick introduction. It is my pleasure to introduce Austin McMillan. Uh, his title is actually the Lifeline and Logistics Coordinator for the City of uh, Houston, Office of Public Safety and Homeland Security. Um, you'll note right away that, I mean, we, we really went after Austin to make sure he was a part of this panel. His title is literally Lifelines and Logistics Coordinator. So we're really excited to hear his presentation today. As I just said, Austin works for the city of Houston under the Regional Catastrophic Preparedness Grant Program, which encompasses a 13 county region, including the city of Houston. Under this program, Austin works to help jurisdictions in the implementation of the community lifeline construct to better enhance the region's preparedness uh, activities. 
Austin is a paramedic with a wealth of experience in the response arena and is working with jurisdictions across Texas as part of the Texas Emergency Medical Task Force and Catastrophic Medical Operations Center. So Austin, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm going to turn it over to you, sir. All righty. Thanks, Chris. Um, just want to confirm that everybody can see the slides. Terry, if you can. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, so thank you all so much for having me. Um, it really is a privilege to be here. And um, I, I, I am extremely passionate uh, about the Lifelines construct. Um, you know, when, when we first started all of this, um, Lifelines was, was somewhat new and, and uh, difficult to really get a lot of information on. And so uh, I, I had seen a few presentations that Chris has given on, on the lifelines and uh, really enjoyed it and, and actually reached out to uh, um, some colleagues of his that had worked on some products. So uh, that was how I got introduced to him. So um, as Chris mentioned, um, I work under a regional catastrophic preparedness grant program. Uh, it's a FEMA program that uh, is awarded to about 10 um, agencies across the country uh, to really work on uh, implementing uh, community lifelines. That was, that was the requirement of the grant. Uh, so the Houston region, the, the 13 counties you see there uh, applied for the FY19 and FY20 grants. Um, in 19, we were awarded uh, the grant for the, the food, water, and shelter, and then 20 health and medical. Um, I, I think this grant program is extremely useful in, in really helping to get that lifelines uh, message and, and uh, people dedicated to do it uh, across the country. Uh, we're a collaborative group that communicate um, at least once a month um, on, on group calls, so it, it's really been great. Uh, when I first started with with the city of Houston and and and, and down this pathway, I, I really ran into some where do I even get started uh, pieces, um, and I, and I think a lot of um, jurisdictions may may have those same uh, questions. And uh, I was extremely lucky. Uh, the Houston region has um, a supply chain group that was actually started post uh, Hurricane Ike, and then uh, through the FEMA technical assistance assistance program and, and a few other uh, really built a robust uh, network of connections and relationships with private sector partners um, in, in, in public entities. And so uh, that was a group that I tapped really early on uh, to, to get this rolling. And uh, so we've, we've created a, a structure for our region. Um, as you can see here, uh, Harris County encompasses the city of Houston, but I've got some really uh, rural areas as well. And so uh, we wanna make sure that this implementation works for everyone, um, that tools we create don't just help the city of Houston, but also help my, my smaller communities. Um, so we've created a regional uh, lifeline steering committee, which is the EMCs for all of the county jurisdictions in the, in the area. Um, that, that can help steer some of this and, and make some of those important decisions to make sure that they implement it in their counties. Um, it, it, I can create a great product, but if people don't use it, then uh, I've really just spun my wheels. Uh, so that committee is, is really instrumental in, in making sure that, that we, we steer this in the right direction. Um, and then beneath that, we've created work groups uh, that have private partners and jurisdictions, uh, NGO, volunteer organizations, those types of things uh, that really get into the nit and gritty and, and uh, dive into um, the plans and, and building out uh, the actual processes. Um, and it's, that's been a great structure for us here uh, to really work within. So uh, those of you who aren't aware, uh, in February, uh, there was quite a large ice storm that hit Texas uh, and caused a few issues. Um, when the ice storm first came in, uh, when we were notified you know, to be on the lookout for it, uh, we started our supply chain calls and uh, uh, communication with those private partners at an early stage. Um, and in those calls, the, the private sector is able to communicate with the jurisdictions and express needs and um, obstacles and expectations and, and, and vice versa. The jurisdictions are able to uh, 
express to the private sector their needs, expectations, and obstacles that they may be facing. Um, and, and that really helps us in, in learning where pre-stage assets may be, where uh, critical infrastructure locations may be, um, and get everybody on that same page. Uh, throughout the incident, there were regular calls uh, with everyone, as well as one-on-ones with, with specific incidents that may have came up. Um, one thing that we'll discuss later on uh, is is this process is it, it, it is it is working. However, uh, it is very time consuming uh, and very resource heavy. And so, um, the 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 use of technology to help uh, this process along is is going to be huge uh, in a long term uh, respect of this. So in the ice storm, um, you know, Chris mentioned a few times cascading effects and uh, um, interdependencies of the lifelines. And, and uh, this ice storm was a prime example of both of those concepts. Uh, so really, our, our, our main problem in, in the Houston area uh, became power outages. Uh, we had widespread outages, uh, some people without power as many as four days. Um, I would actually say that's not super uncommon. Um, it, it, it happened more frequently than it should have. Um, when those power outages started to occur, uh, uh, the first thing that we that we ran into was was generator issues. Uh, so down here in South Texas, we don't typically have a lot of this cold weather, and and people didn't winterize generators. Um, and so we were able to leverage relationships that we had with our uh, supply chain group and, and through that private sector relationship with Texas Oil and Gas, uh, the Houston Fire Department, um, and locate areas where uh, they had um, additives to add to the generator fuel so that that way it wouldn't gunk up in the, in the generator. Um, we were also able to leverage Texas Oil and Gas when we had water issues. Uh, so the, the next cascading effect that we had with power outages uh, became water plants were down. Uh, we were having pipes busted and, and pressure dropping and boil water notices um, and those types of things. And uh, we had hospitals that, that you know, couldn't function. Um, their coolers and, and uh, chillers and, and things like that uh, need water in order to be able to run. And so we again leveraged Texas Oil and Gas, Texas Trucking Association, uh, Department of Transportation to identify tanker trucks that could transport potable water. Uh, if anybody has ever tried to do that, that's a difficult process to actually find a tanker that uh, meets those requirements. Um, but again, those relationships were able to, to leverage to get those, uh, those items that we needed. As we kind of progressed through this and, and people were without power for, for longer periods of time, uh, we really started worrying about homebound patients that relied on oxygen concentrators and uh, bottled oxygen. Uh, roads were treacherous and people weren't able to get out and, and use their normal means of refill. So uh, we worked with, again, the Department of Transportation to identify uh, the suppliers and manufacturers of the oxygen and uh, help them with their plans uh, to help get the, the oxygen back out the door. Um, uh, we had food issues with um, local responders that weren't able to access food uh, because grocery stores were closed. However, through our uh, years of working with, with the supply chain group, we knew uh, most grocery stores actually have a ride out team. Um, and so it was making contacts with those managers and things like that that were staying at those stores and, and finding out, you know, can you open the back door so that a, a police car can come and, and get food so that they can take it to uh, the police station and cook it. Um, and that was also used in shelter operations because again, uh, when this first started, nobody envisioned this being uh, as bad and as long as it was. Uh, and shelters were, were not prepared with the amount of food they needed. Um, so we were able to leverage those relationships for that. As water started coming back online uh, for all of the residents, uh, the water treatment centers started running into chlorine shortages. Uh, that's not something that you typically store in, in massive quantities uh, for safety reasons. 
And we were again tapped uh, Department of Transportation to help us locate additional chlorine uh, manufacturers and, and get those to the to the water treatment facilities. So all of these cascading effects happened because of the power outage. Um, but we were able to help mitigate the effects uh, with the use of the supply chain group, uh, which again falls under that uh, th those lifelines. So some challenges in implementing community lifelines. Uh, so uh, a ma major challenge that we have faced uh, is is the leveraging of technology. So. Uh, everyone uses something different, uh, right? Private sector, uh, a lot of them use Saber, there's Gas Buddy, there's WebEOC, there's uh, EM Resource, EM Track, Esri, uh, other GIS, uh, ArcGIS Online, um, things like that. And everybody has different ways that they're doing stuff. And so we've got to find a way that we can standardize some information um, at the very least, uh, standardize some export of data sets from, from places so that we can uh, communicate to that same language uh, across all of the sectors. Another issue that we've found uh, in, in using some of this, these data sets has been protected information. Uh, a lot of the private sector agencies are hesitant to allow public access to some of this data. Um, for competitive purposes, as well as security purposes. And so um, uh, one thing that we're working on here is, is really helping to, to build uh, relationships with our private partners and, and understand that we want the data for uh, some, some standard uh, public safety measures and, and try and get them comfortable with that and, and letting them under, you know, understand that this isn't going to wind up on CNN news because um, that that's the last thing they want, um, and so bringing those agreements on board is 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 huge. Um, the other thing I think is socialization of everything. Um, again, community lifelines kind of started in uh, 2018, um, and then had their initial toolkit, and then late 2019 came out with toolkit 2.0. Uh, right before COVID hit and a lot of emergency managers across the country have just been extremely busy. And so um, just getting that construct uh, and this, this uh, philosophy out to emergency managers is, is I think, you know, the first step. Uh, the next step is socializing what technology exists. Um, I remember seeing a, a question in the Q&A about, uh, you know, how do we get these data sets? And, and I think you know, it's gonna be discussed uh, again later on. This technology piece is, is, is huge. Uh, it's what's going to drive uh, this implementation. Uh, and then just letting emergency managers know how this is gonna help, right? Inevitably, we're, we're taking up more time of theirs. And so they've, they've got to see the benefit from it. Uh, and then relationships, relationships, relationships. Uh, both interconnected between public sectors as well as public private partnerships uh, that's going to be the key to this success so some some lessons learned um, again that information sharing right so uh, small distribution list for official use only you know this isn't going to be be shared with with the general public uh, Chris had mentioned some some things being uh, you know publicly available, and there and there definitely are some of those sources that are that are public facing. Um, I know a lot of power companies that do that and, and stuff like that. Uh, and I think there's we need to make a distinction between what is and will be public facing and what may not necessarily be. What what do we need to keep a little more secure for for security purposes, and then and then building those relationships. Um, one of the things that we really do well here in the Houston area is leverage associations. Uh, so being such a large area, you know, I, I can't uh, reach out to every grocery store, convenience store, um, or food access location. Uh, it's just unfeasible. And so we, we leverage uh, associations like the Texas Restaurant Association, Texas Retailers Association, um, Food and Fuel, uh, those member organizations that can uh, participate with us on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but then have wide distribution of, of the data uh, and information. And so uh, those have really been instrumental in, in our implementation here. Uh, so some next steps for us. Again, I think technology is the absolute key to this. 
Um, and uh, Chris hit the nail on the head, uh, real-time data versus static data. Uh, you know, static data is, is relatively easy to come across. It's that real-time uh, situational awareness that we've got to find ways to, uh, to leverage the data sources that exist. Um, oddly enough, through this process, I have found that there are a lot of data sets out there that exist. Um, in, in the relationships that I've talked to and, and, and things like that. It's finding out who to talk to to get the information and then how do you make them feel uh, secure giving you that information. So uh, those, are, those are kind of the next steps and something that I think FEMA is working on. I think those of us at the local level are working on it. Um, and, and that's gonna be the, the key to this success. There's my contact information and I will turn it back over to Chris. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Austin. That was brilliant. I, I really appreciate appreciate your uh, your discussion there. I, I wrote a number of notes down, especially as it related to cascading effects. I think you did a really good job of, it's not just the power, it's, it's what's the power outage and its relationship to everything else from, you know, grocery stores and police officers having to go and take it back to their unit to, to cook food for people that need it. Um, I really picked up on the fact of socialization. In fact, you know, going back to some of the questions that we're seeing already in the uh, chat is, you know, what exists and what data is out there right now? So uh, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to pause on questions for you right now and get to our next panelist, if that's okay with you, sir. And then we'll, come, we'll circle back to some of that. Um, but a little bit of a teaser for some of the people that are asking those questions is there's not a lot really out there. That's few and far between to really cover down on the seven lifelines and then the 28 components. And so I think that's why I got so excited in my presentation. I wanted you guys to know that that's where I feel the, power, the pain points are, are defining those elements and then those data standards and schemas. And I think that's a community-wide discussion and, and quite frankly, the purpose of today's panel discussion. So we're all in this together. With that, I'm gonna transition now, if I may, uh, to Zach. Zach Stanfer is the state coordinator uh, at crisis, and he's within the Crisis Information and Disaster Intelligence. Um, I, you know what, I'm goofing up on the bio. I'm trying to read his title and let me get right into his bio. I apologize that. So Zach Stanfer joined the Oklahoma Department of Emergency Management and Homeland Security in 2016 as a special projects officer and was later promoted to the state coordinator for crisis information and disaster intelligence. In this role, Zach works in the State Emergency Operations Center and oversees the agency's data management programs and many interagency and intragovernmental information partnerships, including GIS and WebEOC. Zach is passionate about data-driven innovations in emergency management and is a member of the International Association of Emergency Managers and their Emerging Technology Committee. Meteorology is another close passion, and Zach enjoys keeping up with the latest trends in weather and risk communication. So it's my pleasure to introduce Zach to the panel. I'm excited for you guys to hear his presentation today. Thanks so much, Chris. And uh, Terry, could you just verify you can see the screen and hear me okay? I can. You're good to go. Awesome. Thank you so much. So first off, thank you to NAPSIG for hosting this, uh, this really good collaborative forum here. Um, not only the conference, but this specific session. I also uh, was jotting down viciously all the things Austin was talking about and some Chris was saying too. So um, the presenters are still learning too, just important to know <laughs> as we go through all of this. Um, so as we go forward, I wanna talk some of that today about data powered community lifelines. Um, we've talked a lot about the power of community lifelines. We encountered several challenges in Oklahoma uh, in kind of adopting and, and finding the right way to adopt really uh, lifelines. And so I'm sure some of these challenges are not unique to us. And I wanted to share some of those. Um, quite realistically, we had whenever we moved, you know, the concepts of lifelines kind of kind of came about uh, for the Department of Emergency Management, and Homeland Security and the State Emergency Operations Center. Um, we said, you know, what happens when you go yellow? What, what does that mean to someone watching? Uh, what does that mean to FEMA? Are they going to start doing things differently? Are the uh, are the local jurisdictions going to start thinking we're not prepared? Um, in reality, we're using their lifelines a lot of times to drive ours. And so um, if we don't have information from their jurisdiction and they're the one impacted, how do we respond? And so if you're asking those questions in your own jurisdiction, I just wanted you to know you're not alone. 
because those are very much things that we are asking uh, still <laughs> uh, to this point in some respects. And so what we ultimately found uh, as we kind of delved into the components and some of the guidance provided by FEMA was that we actually were already starting on a lot of this. And so a lot of the processes we already used, we're already employing the concepts, but maybe without that name. And maybe we didn't have quite all of the components. And so those were a great guideline for us. Um, but we did find that we were, we were basically capturing a lot of the same information, but possibly not in the right way. And so um, we, we saw it first as how can we get all of our locals to to start reporting, uh, you know, as a state, we have to care about local emergency managers, tribal emergency managers, um, and in Oklahoma, the the cities and counties report the same way. So, how do we how do we rapidly uh, scale an adoption in this fashion whenever the resources uh, available to those local jurisdictions are so uh, varying across the state? And so, instead of changing, instead of saying the language of "we'll set the expectation um, for local emergency managers." We changed that language to say we need to set the example, and so we had to we had to change some things at home uh, before we expected locals to kind of take suit. And so now we we've kind of gotten to speaking the language at least on a lot of our outgoing products, um, including not only to um, local emergency managers but other state partners and state leadership. And so they're kind of getting used to understanding the lingo at this point of okay, we're green, okay, we're yellow, we we know where we need to work. And so most of our briefing products now include some sort of lifeline connection or impact statement. And I'm going to talk some about GIS uh, coming up, but I just wanted to kind of highlight that you can do a lot of work just by forcing yourself to think about it um, in day to day, if you're, especially if you're just now kind of adopting some of these components. And so um, we issue situational awareness briefings and products uh, that contain a lot of information, but we've actually been able to reduce the footprint of those uh, by implementing community lifelines in a respect that we can group the information differently. And so um, it's, it's been pretty impressive uh, to see the response and to see kind of how that information, uh, people know where to look now. It's not, you're not searching for 10 sources of information. Um, even though it was already provided, now it's grouped in a new way. So uh, those, are, those are really important things to note. One thing I want to talk about uh, very specifically is what happens um, whenever we actually decide to make decisions using lifelines and data. So we started this adventure like a lot of you probably are. And the adventure we started said, okay, what data do we have and what data do we need? And we ran into the exact same things a lot of people are mentioning here is that where is the data available? Um, personally in Oklahoma, uh, landlocked Oklahoma, <laughs> I found a lot of data for um, specific types of information like uh, fuel availability and um, outages for various things were very specific um, at least in the private sector world to the coastal states because hurricanes were the key impact. And so overcoming some of those challenges has been interesting too. Um, I guess the majority of the country is landlocked. And so, you know, other, other states are gonna be facing those same challenges. And I'd be curious if anyone's um, overcome those in a special way. Um, but that said, I've kind of highlighted a few things here. This is definitely not exhaustive, but static data is so critical still, even though it is static and isn't changing. I mean, you know, it's changing as it's updated, but it's not changing in real time, but it's so critical still to understand what's going on. Oklahoma has over three dozen tribal jurisdictions and understanding simply where those boundaries lie sometimes. Um, and those, those jurisdictions can span several counties um, to very small portions of one county. And so uh, we have a lot of different uh, dynamics at play whenever it comes to understanding who's where. Uh, but then we can also take that a step further and, you know, incorporate some of that dynamic data, just like they were talking about. So one of the platforms, um, or one of the areas that I think we're going to see a lot of success in, in, in our world, and I think other people could learn from this too, uh, hopefully, is using, using static data that you say, you know what, this is really good, but I need it to be dynamic. Well, static data can become dynamic. Um, through using WebEOC and through partnering with other agencies, we've had big success in basically deciding, um, you know, we have this static data available to show us where water system service areas are, but we have real-time reports that come in right now. Um, one project we've just recently worked on, and it's still kind of in the, in the early stages, is basically partnering with our state's uh, Department of Environmental Quality to say, would you mind reporting this in WebEOC? Does that change anything for you? They actually found an advantage to it. And so now in WebEOC, we're able to, to serve that out in real time. So what was a static data layer now becomes a dynamic one. And so um, it, it's been a big learning experience, but things like that really change the way um, you're able to work with static data. And so I think it's important to remember some static data just needs to stay static, <laughs> uh, but there is certainly some benefit to expanding that. 
Um, like Austin mentioned, uh, we, we also had some interesting challenges, certainly none to the scale of Texas, uh, but still to the scale of unprecedented for Oklahoma in that we had to go to rolling blackouts. That was something that had never occurred from the energy providers that we've asked uh, in Oklahoma or our energy balancing authority. And so while our impacts from that event in February were so minimal compared to Texas, it did teach us a lot of lessons. Um, understanding those energy in interconnects are, are pretty significant to understanding how your um, impacts to energy might be. And we agree. We've also had challenges um, finding certain types of data for energy, especially fuel um, that is authoritative. However, we have used some crowdsourcing tools such as GasBuddy. And so there, there are tools available out there, but you do run into that reliability thing, uh, which is, you know, how can I really trust this? If there's nobody there, is the data actually relevant anyway? There's a lot of things to consider there. So um, ultimately just, just take a deep look at your components and just basically take a look at what, what types of data can actually matter. On the transportation lifeline, I wanna mention a couple of things that, that kind of stand out to me. One thing um, that is easy to forget about transportation is it includes pipelines. So whenever it comes to oil, uh, those, those might not seem logical to fit there in every, you know, in every situation, but pipelines might not serve your direct energy system. And so they don't always fit energy, but they do move through your state and they can be a significant risk. And so understanding the, the locations and the risks of those, um, as well as hazardous commodity flows um, associated with interstates and, and roadways can really prove to be a, a beneficial planning tool. Um, one of the things that we took from the transportation lifeline, uh, and it was mentioned earlier, was ways. Um, that's one example of a system that can do not only, uh, you know, send you information from a crowdsourced uh, platform, but also allow you to share that data back to Waze. And so if you have information on emergencies, they offer a partner program. Um, and I'm sure other platforms do similar. This is just the one that's been most available to me. And I wanted to make sure that was known here. Um, obviously, the concept is what we're looking at here is the ability to get the crowdsourced traffic information, including alerts and jams, um, so that you understand where, where critical infrastructure might not be accessible or where transportation is compromised. But then also you can, you can feed that inf feed information to the network. So you're able to feed back information concerning um, closures or hazards, but also shelters. And so if you have information concerning vaccination centers, those are something that's available right now to add to that platform. So it's been really exciting to see that platform evolve. Um, we, we always work, work heavily with volunteers, um, primarily locally, um, but through ways you kind of get a bigger volunteer network as well, because it's backed by a big network of those folks. So um, if you haven't explored that, it might be worth checking out. Um, and there's a link on the screen to get more information about that. Um, some ideas we have, and I'm excited to get to questions because I think we're going to get to delve into some more. Um, we have some, uh, some information concerning static data uh, for communications infrastructure, but a lot of that does not have associated real-time information. And just like Austin mentioned and Chris have mentioned, static data isn't the answer when you need real-time data, but there are mechanisms to turn your static data real uh, or into real-time or dynamic data. And so we're going to be exploring new ways to try that. Um, and, and to kind of understand where limitations might be. One thing that I think is critically important is to, to do, as you plan with partners, identify what data sets they have available uh, and, and understand more about what those gaps are, just like you would for physical equipment or personnel resources, understand what data they have available to meet their mission, and then also work with them um, to find ways you can share that data. And we've, we've had to establish a few MOUs. We did run into to challenges with, um, you know, uh, the, 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 audience of data, the FOUO status and things like that. So MOUs can be a game changer for that. Um, we do produce a lot of products that serve not only the state emergency operations center, but also local emergency managers. And so it's been beneficial to, to kind of understand what data products we could share where, um, and, and really to empower our local emergency managers too, uh, to better make decisions. What we have found is that we take some burden away from local emergency managers by sort of for lack of a better term, automating some of these lifelines. I don't need an emergency manager to tell me they're without power if we have data that tells me they're without power in their community. And so they can focus on areas where we actually need them to report. And so anytime we can reduce a reporting burden on a local emergency manager, I'm all for it. And I think they are too. <laughs> so uh, from what they tell me at least. So um, a lot of information there to gather, um, but I wanna make sure we have time to get to questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and move to my contact slide. But again, thank you to Napsig for hosting this. And um, thank you again for having me as a part of it. So back to you, Chris. 
Thanks, Zach. That, that, that was amazing. I, I was writing just like just like with Austin. I'm not even kidding, you know, so uh, a whole bunch of notes, you know, what does it mean to be yellow? Um, I think we're all asking that question. Um, you know, what does that mean? What does that mean from an interdependency standpoint? You know, what, and then the bigger question is, what does that mean, you know, in relation to thyras and the preparedness side of the house or on the opposite end of, of response, what does that mean into the recovery phase? You know, how, how do we get back to um, stable, right? And I'm so excited. I think you've nailed it. You hit it on the, you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, going from static to operational. And I really think that's where technology and recognizing that we're talking to about 176 technologists of various different skill sets and various different platforms of how do you really paint an overall comprehensive situational awareness picture on that one entity. If you're talking about a specific place like a hospital, somebody's gonna have a different view of that hospital over the course of that incident, whether it's from a pre-incident thyra preparedness planning kind of concept into the initial response, into the, you know, the initial part of recovery and throughout the duration of an incident, no matter where you're coming from, local, county, tribal, territorial, state, local, private partner, um, uh, you know, how, how do we share that information and move from static to operational? And so I think you've nailed it that I think technology is, is, is really going to help us uh, uh, paint the way for that. And so speaking of technologists and, and painting the way for it, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, two, two, two colleagues right, right off the bat. So um, Tom and Stacy, Tom, Mr. Moran, Tom Moran, I'm Tom since Hurricane Sandy. Um, Mr. Moran serves as the executive director for the All Hazards Consortium, a regional 501c3 organization focused on multi-state homeland security, emergency management, and business continuity issues. Mr. Moran supports the AHC's efforts to assist state and local government in their efforts to integrate the private sector and operators of critical infrastructure and federal partners in the areas of disaster management, sensitive information sharing, cybersecurity, and solution development to operational issues. He's also joined today by Stacy Neal. Stacy is the Planning Division Director with the Virginia Department of Emergency Management. She oversees strategic and operational planning, geographic information systems, the critical infrastructure and private sector program, the state warning point, the agency's 24, as well as the agency's 24-7 watch center. She currently serves as the state's private sector lead for the COVID-19 response and recovery efforts. Stacy has a bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia and a master's degree in emergency and disaster management from the American Military University. Stacy is an IAEM certified emergency manager. So it's my pleasure right now to turn the floor over to uh, Tom and Stacy. I'm, I'm really excited for you guys to hear how they're using data in the private sector to inform state and private sector response operations. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Um, honored to be uh, part of this and supporting you and NAPSA, great organization, certainly. And um, the GIS topic has uh, a lot of tentacles. <laughs> so uh, we're excited to be here. So we're going to talk today about operational use of GIS data, but in a, in a hard swim lane to, to function in. Um, so let me just jump into this real quick. It's really about supporting lifelines and integrating that into the operational planning of how you do it. So the, if you're not familiar with the consortium, it's a, formed in 2005. We're in our 16th year. We're a nonprofit started by states really on the East Coast, but it's now nationwide, it supports critical infrastructure and a number of topics around the country. So we are operational problem solving. That's what we focus on, okay? Uh, we didn't start that way. We evolved there until Sandy, and Sandy took us into the operational world because we had a we had a, a, a big trust framework across the, um, the the various sectors. So Lifeline supported. So we do everything but the bookends. Really, we kind of support the bookends, if you will, Chris, but in a transportation logistics sense, right? Um, but our our role is really to look at how can we support. Uh, Sector one is what all the, we had a big meeting in 2012, about two months before Sandy, we had dozen states 
maybe six or eight sectors and we facilitate them through a work group. And he said, folks, we got to come down to one sector that all of you agree needs to get back on first. And we had a big debate, comms and like that. And unanimously, I mean, this is New York City, DC, uh, states up and down the East Coast, unanimously, they all said power. If you get power on first, that's the tide that raises all ships. So we spent the, re the really last several years focused on power and it's moved very quickly into other, you know, areas where the life sign, the, the lifelines really identify that, including comms and transportation, so forth. And so this graphic is an important one. I want you guys to know, we see data as four layers, right? Easy to find, hard to find, sensitive, never to be shared, uh, and then fee-based, stuff you pay for. Um, where we try to operate is in layering all of these to a specific problem. It's hard. Okay, and especially in that sensitive area, that is not going to be shared with government ever. I'll lose my job. This is the this is the mantra, many times going on in the minds of private sector. Yet, if we can create the right environment, um, I think Austin said, if we build that trust, uh, there's a potential at happening. So, um, over the last many years, we've been doing that uh, on specific use cases, and I'm really glad Stacy's on with us. Stacy is an innovator on this. Um, so what are the challenges we've run into? I think we've heard it a couple of times, trust. There's no, there's no standard for, so for trust. So states and utilities got together and built a standard and it's called the operational readiness level. It is a standard for confidence and it's a federated agreement, nine steps. It is really well done. It was stole or borrowed from NASA who developed this for years and the uh, private sector grabbed that and it basically is called the operational readiness level. It's ranked one to four. It allows anyone, public or private, to take a data set, plug it through the standard. It's a free online tool. The URLs are on the screen there. And you can rank your data against the metrics. And the metrics are published right out in the open. You'll get a chance to see it. Um, thank you. Somebody put that in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, this is an idea to build the standard and build a community around it so that if we need to improve it or enhance it, why did we develop this? Because operational decision makers did not trust the data they were getting from many of the folks you guys mentioned today um, because they didn't know when it was refreshed, is it secure, all these factors. So we got agreement on the factors and there's the ORL standard. Uh, and it really works. And a lot of the data we use has to have an ORL ranking on it or we don't use it. It's just that simple. Um, and it's growing. So I invite you to test it out. It's totally open. Uh, and if you want to become part of that uh, community, just let us know. We'd be glad to do it. But the big, the big thing is the operational thing, right? And Stacy's going to talk to this. Stacy and I have known each other for many years. Uh, it's now, how do, you make G, how do you make GIS relevant in the mind of the operational decision maker? You know, in the electric sector, when they decide to move trucks from, uh, you know, Connecticut to Alabama, you know, you've got fleets moving, it's a million dollars an hour when you've got a bunch of companies all doing it. It's a very expensive decision. So they need to know that data is reliable and damage assessment is the first domino. Nothing can happen until we know what's broke. The states have their damage assessment, utilities have their damage assessment. And so within this initiative called SiceNet, we'll explain that another time, we're bringing data from utilities and VDEM, bringing it together in one dashboard, I'll show you in a minute, and Stacy's really been the, I think, one of the most forward-leaning states uh, in the use of GIS. Virginia's been a tremendous job. So I want to turn this over to Stacy and have her kind of walk through this use case because it's gathering a lot of steam right now with the utilities because it's a big issue. It's a number, it's a number one problem. So let me introduce Stacy and Stacy, take it from here. All right. Thanks, Tom, and and thank you to Napsig for having me today. Um, so, so I, I think Tom uh, got to the crux of the problem with damage assessment. That is our, our first step in recovery. Um, if we don't understand what is broken, what is damaged, then we cannot make decisions on where we need to send resources. And even further than that, um, make a decision to determine our eligibility for a federal declaration, federal reimbursement. Um, so a lot of, you know, as we all, as we all know, it all comes down to dollars. Um, that's on the on the government side and on the private sector side. So being able to assess damage very quickly uh, with as few resources as possible is really important. And I think nothing has shown us that than COVID. Uh, we experienced this last year in Virginia with Hurricane Isaias. Um, and being able to do damage assessments remotely 
Uh, so that forced us to take advantage of, um, of some, some traditional GIS uh, tools that have not traditionally been used in emergency management. Um, so, so as Tom mentioned, yes, states and utilities are both gathering data. Uh, I think I would argue that the federal government is also um, gathering data. And last year during her, or well, it was during Hurricane Isaias and in the immediate aftermath, um, I had folks from NOAA contacting me, the National Guard and Civil Air Patrol were contacting me. Um, and we were collecting imagery from some of our first responders at the state level and the local level. So we were able to bring all of this data together into one platform um, using GIS, which helped us at a state level get a better perspective and a much quicker time frame of the damage that had occurred across the state. So um, similarly, utilities are doing this. Dominion Energy is doing this because they, they need to restore power. It is the pinnacle of getting us uh, back onto the road to recovery is restoring power as many other sectors, uh, lifelines are dependent on power. So they're doing damage assessments as well. Um, and, and what we have not been able to do up until now is, is share that data. So through the, the SISNET, we have been able to share a level of data that was not previously possible um, between states and private sector. Um, so one of the challenges that, to sharing that data was trust, um, legal issues, uh, just past history and relationships. I'll go back to that relationships that was mentioned earlier and technology, challenges with technology. Uh, one quick example, uh, in Virginia, um, we had a, an incident, a trail, de a train derailment um, that spilled into one of our waterways. It's a major drinking water source for multiple jurisdictions several years ago. Um, and that the, the private sector railroad company was very willing to work with us, but we on the state side had to say, wait, don't share your data if it's proprietary because we can't protect it. So one of the things that came from that is that that we have now passed a law, a state law um, that has some FOIA exemptions. So it protects data when the private sector shares it with us if it's critical infrastructure in nature. Um, so that, that was one way that Virginia um, has been able to protect some, some levels of data. But by sharing through the SISNET that really has, come, has uh, actually uh, amplified our ability to share data because we are sharing real time. We're not giving our data away. It's sharing, it's viewing, but we still retain ownership. Um, so we are able to share GIS data in real time with, with private sector entities through the SISNET portal that gives us better than, it's not static data. Um, and as long as we have our agreements in place ahead of time, it's not, not also another drain on our GIS staff during an, emer, an EOC activation. We're able to uh, turn on those groups and the, the, that access very quickly, um, let the data roll and we can continue on our way with the duties that we have internally in our EOC. <clears throat> So enhancing the, the last two bullets on, on the previous slide kind of speak to what Chris brought up earlier, being able, having situational awareness, event characterization and decision making uh, support. And that's really what this boils down to by being able to share private sector information and public sector information in one portal, we are providing better situational awareness, not only internally to our uh, state partners in the EOC, but also to our private sector partners to enhance situational awareness. We're getting a better idea of, of what the characterization is, what is the impact, what is broken, how badly is it broken, um, and, and, and what resources do we need to bring to bear. And then finally making decisions, decisions uh, at the policy level and decisions about how we will go um, about our recovery and, and requesting our uh, requesting a declaration for reimbursement from the federal government. So, so to the, to the, the, the benefits of SISNET, uh, I mentioned the, the FOIA exemption already, but standardization is another great example. Being able to standardize the data sets, having a confidence level in those data sets so that when we are accessing them, we don't have to guess um, how, how confident we are in that, that data set. It's already been done for us. Um, and, and that helps break down trust challenges as well. Uh, the technology itself, um, GIS really provides intelligent data for us. It's not just geographic, but it's also tabular data. 
um, and we're able to bring that that together in ways that we could not we have not been able to do before. Uh, so so information that may not have seemed to have a um, a, a link to each other suddenly when you put it onto a map actually now has that linkage. Uh, and, and certainly when we pair that up with private sector data, what we're finding is that that not it not only enhances situational awareness because we have more data, but we're actually able um, to to link that data in ways we could not previously previously do. So on this slide right here, you'll see um, this is just a snapshot of the actual portal where Dominion Energy has shared their data. Uh, we have shared data from our ArcGIS online. Uh, crisis track that we've pulled in from, from the, the crisis track system, which is what we use in Virginia, into GIS, our um, requests for assistance that have come from Web EOC, and then the civil air patrol uh, photos that were taken, aerial photos that were taken um, in the aftermath uh, after ESIAS. So we're bringing all three of those data sets um, into our GIS platform and then able to easily share them to the SISNET. And Tom, I think it's back to you. Okay. Um, Stacy, I want to pull on one thread you said is very important, is FOIA protection. Now, this isn't avoiding criminal investigations and hiding from the law. This is protecting against, and we get them, frivolous competitive inquiries about what's going on. A news person wants to find out how to nail the utility, right? Uh, there's vicious people out there that do that. There's also people that are just curious, they want to know. And if there's a hint of any of that, the private sector pulls back. And so you've heard about the SICE. The SICE is a private sector run legal framework that has technology, ESRI component to do that. Every person is vetted in there. It's not a public form. It's, it's, a, it's a way to share data by use case. So like a little honeycomb, everybody's access to different cells based on your privilege level. But it has removed the, the, it has removed the legal concern and the FOIA issue is as big enough, as big for government as it was for the private sector. So these, this use case was made totally possible because of the two years of legal work that the group did to design the size, which led to the ORL standard and so forth. So we see great promise ahead. We're in a pilot phase right now with this damage assessment use case, but coming right behind it will be a lot of other, uh, what we call tier three, right? That hard to find, never shared data. Um, we want to, to utilize that type of data, which is tenfold anything else that's out there. It's just not operationalized uh, in, a, in, a, in a public private sense. So um, anyway, that's how we're using GIS data to, um, to help with damage assessment. And let me give you some metrics. The uh, utilities, we have 11 utilities watching Dominion. <laughs> and, and Chris, if Dominion likes it, right? They're really like, okay, this, this is kind of how it happens, right? And the number of states are watching Stacy, right? It's kind of funny. Um, but the power here is this data was, uh, is going to affect life safety, number one. Two, customer sat rating, branding, which is a big issue for every utility. More importantly, it's gonna reduce the cycle to storm restoration by, I don't wanna give out a specific number, but let's say it was a hefty percentage because the, more, the faster you can find out what's broken, the faster you can fix. And it only takes 24 hours to figure out what's broken. Uh, it it might've taken a lot longer in Texas after the ice storm because it was so prolific. But if we can get the damage assessment thing done faster, everybody wins. Well, one of the communications companies heard about this, saw this and said, you know what? If you can protect my data, I'd like to see this, but I'll give you my actual cell tower status data, right? In exchange, so it's setting up kind of a barter mindset. The trick is that legal protection of the data, the vetting of the individuals, and it's the partitioning of the data into a specific cell. So only the certain people from FEMA or Virginia or Texas or Oklahoma have permission to look at it for a period of time and then it goes off, right? That, that level three data we talked about there is only going to be shared for an incident. It's not going to be on all the time, but it takes, that's kind of the, the framework for this. So um, anyway, I just, our, we're done. Uh, our contact information, LinkedIn profiles are there. Uh, Chris, thanks for inviting us. Really, it's been great working with Terry and everybody and, and meeting the rest of the crew. So uh, we'll stop. And, Tom, uh, I just I just wanted to add one more thing because the last two uh, presenters have mentioned it as well as Chris. 
And that's the availability of authoritative data sets. Uh, one of the things that I have found extremely beneficial uh, with the SISNET is that I have a force multiplier. Um, there are other states that have representatives on this group as well as the private sector. So when we bring up a problem, how are we going to get fuel information? Is gas buddy the best place to go? Is there another source? Um, we've actually got a force multiplier. Folks out there that have access to that information and or have knowledge of where we might be able to get that information so that there's not 50 states and, and thousands, thousands of localities that are trying to get that same data. We're all getting it um, in one location and it's being shared broadly. And so I think that's another value of the SISNET is we all know um, garbage in, garbage out. So we want authoritative data and if we can find it once and provide it to everyone, then that's the that that's that, that's a um, that's a great way to leverage that resource. Yeah, thank you, Stacy. And if anybody would like information on that, just send me an email here, and we'll get you plug in. the The idea is to have a vetted community ranking data that they can all pull from. And if data is not ranked, it could be great. But if it's not ranked from an operational standpoint, we're not going to use it, or, or the utilities are telling us we're not going to use it. So. It's not, you know, it ranks one through four. If you're ranked four, that's not bad, right? You can, that's good. It's kind of proceed at your own risk. But if you're not ranked at all, then they really, sh they really want to get stuff ranked. So that's why they wanted to share the link with you all, invite you to become part of the process. And I think Stacy said it, that we, we want to create a community around this. So it's not any one specific entity has control of anything. It's done by a trusted community to do it. So um, anyway, thank you again for having us. And um, Oh, Chris, I'll turn it back over to you. <laughs> thanks, Tom, and thanks, Stacy. I, I just, uh, I realized for those that, I don't know if you could have even heard me on the last one, I didn't even have my headset plugged in. So I'm learning too, I'm learning how to be a better moderator. Um, I, I, you know, so that's it for our presentations. Uh, but first of all, I just really, really want to thank this tremendous panel uh, that, that we've had today. We've got about 15 minutes left. You've got uh, what I think are, are just some of the, the, uh, the rock stars in the industry and private sector state, you know, two state partners, a, a local partner. You know, there's a lot of folks on this line um, and folks that I recognize. I'm getting emails from colleagues that are a part of this 170 participant list. So there's some really, really big brains in this group. And so what I'd love to do now is open this up um, to a Q&A. Um, and, I, you know, obviously, I think we've got, you know, some, some targeted folks here from the panels, but there's, there's like I said, a lot of really brilliant people uh, on, the, on the list. So, Terry, how do we want to tackle this next? I'm going to open it up to you. I just clicked on the QR code. And uh, we, we um, what are we going to do? We're going to open that up to the group for... Yes, so we have all, all of our speakers are amazing. Um, they've been feverishly working in the background, typing answers uh, when they weren't speaking. So a lot of the questions have been answered already. So thanks to them for that. We do have a few minutes to just hit a question or two. Um, I think Daniel has uh, put in a number of questions. So I think it would be great to hit on one of his. Um, so one of the first questions he mentioned, I think we can all relate to is, one of the biggest issues that we faced with some of these lifelines is the aspect of how they're interrelated with other planning concepts such as core capabilities, but also feeds of data. For example, energy is one of the hardest, one of the most data secure for federal use only. Any discussions on how to get that shared out broader? And I know we had just one kind of example locally there. I don't know if any of our panel wants to chime in on some other successes or how they see this kind of moving forward. And let's see, Zach, did you just raise your hand to uh, help us out? Yeah, um, I didn't know how we were supposed to <laughs> no, address the perfect. question, but hopefully that works. So um, to Daniel's question, I think a lot of that is, is, is happening beyond you. You're not alone. For example, we found challenges accessing um, information through uh, authoritative sources like the Department of Energy. However, we've had success accessing data that was available through uh, effectively crowdsourcing actual utility data. And so um, 
it's it's pretty widely used at this point, like poweroutages.us or poweroutage.us. And so those are those are used right now. The Weather Channel is using that data to to provide live power outage information. And so sometimes you can't get the authoritative data source without a lot of red tape, but other times there's other data sources with probably a lower reliability score, um, as you know Tom kind of alluded to there. But some of that data could still be used to make decisions, and so I think there's just some compromises there uh, that sort of act as band aids almost to to kind of bridge that gap. But um, that's how we've found success in that. But we have had the same challenge. Tom, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, Zach, you nailed it. Um, we looked at nine power outage sites. Nine. Um, we had 30, 40 companies involved in that. Power Outage US is the one to use right now. Federated agreement. They all agreed. I said, you guys got to pick one. And they picked that one. Why is that? It's fast. It's real time. And the authoritative source is the utility posting that data. Uh, it isn't crowdsourced. That would immediately drop to a four if it was crowdsourced. But because it's a utility owning that, we have an aggregator in between pulling it together. It's a two and in some cases a one, which is ready to go. So Again, half the battle is just kind of doing the work, and everybody agreeing this is the best because there is no best. It's just we decide as a community, we're all going to use that. You can use anything you want, but in our world, we have to synchronize 150 people like, like Zach, right? We've got to coordinate utility and state, and you have to have some kind of agreement. So I'm, I'm glad you brought up poweroutage.us. That is right now, that's the one that we're standardizing on across the board. I'll also say, if I did say crowdsource, I did misspeak. It was They're not crowdsourced, they're using utilities. So they're basically referencing the website to get the information. Um, one, of the thing, one of the things that's, uh, and Daniel's commented again, he's, he's on it, man. <laughs> um, and uh, Daniel says, you know, the, the issues aren't, aren't always that the, the data is available, but it's the resolution, county level. And uh, we, still, we still encounter that too. We do have, they do have city level data or utility level data as well. So um, it, it's, it's how it's working at the moment. And uh, I think we have a place that there are ways to add utilities also to, to poweroutage.us, which we found. We were initially hesitant because not all of the utilities in our area were included, right. um, but they were responsive to adding. So that, that added our that added to our, our calculation of, of choosing them as well. Yeah, and their paid service is really inexpensive relative, right? Uh, and they get down really to the dog licking the bone at the county level. And there's another initiative going on right now in the private sector where they're gonna merge, um, they're gonna merge IP router, like I won't name a company, but cable TV folks, they wanna merge that with power outage to get a power outage data at the street address. This is happening right now, okay? I, I won't say where, but I know it's on top of it. They've talked to our work group about it. I think over the next year, you're gonna see this get really granular because um, that data is already there. The cable companies already use that data and been using it for decades. They just never wanted to let it out because it's competitively sensitive, right? In a high rise in New York, the power can be onto the building, but the power's out on various floors and there's three carriers in there. They wanna share that data with Con Edison, but they don't want it, the other ones to see each other's data. So this is the use case we're trying to work through. So. This is a great discussion. I'm glad you guys brought it up and, and uh, stay tuned. This is going to get better very quickly. Thank you uh, all for kind of jumping in there. I know a lot of these are just complicated questions. We have a couple more and then we'll, we'll have to address the rest offline. But I know we have one specifically to Chris. Um, and Chris had kind of mentioned this at the top of the hour about there only being just a few data sets available um, and in limited ways and sometimes not even shareable to the public side. So if you have access to them, you can do some work, but maybe you can't uh, share, that, share that out with in any of the things you're sort of doing. I don't know if you can speak to that if you see that in there, Chris. Yeah, if I understand the question correctly, um, you know, what do you guys hide behind the curtain? Um, I think the honest answer is not much. There's, you know, there's really not a lot of nationally level, national level data sets that are out there. Um, um, about the only one I can even think of is actually this power outage um, map. Um, uh, we currently use DOE's Eagle Eye that is widely available to state, local, county, uh, tribal territory, anybody with a, you know, a, 
a vetted need that's all cleared through DOE. That's the authoritative source of information. But as Zach and Tom just uh, reiterated, um, and if they didn't say it, I'll say it, there are holes, there's gaps in, in Eagle Eye. And you have to go and you have to supplement that with you know, information from where you can find it. And so you're hearing it in the panelist discussion. You know, and I'm, I really think this is going back to what I think is so powerful about the lifelines. It really articulates what are those big major muscle movements that we're trying to track, those seven major components and then the sub components under that, um, transportation, power, communications. I think this year and into next year, you're really gonna start to see those silos break down because so many things are starting to become standardized. Obviously some things are still gonna be restricted, mainly due to, as Tom mentioned, competitive nature or, 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 or there are security concerns for some of these things. But at least I think to answer the question concretely, if we can, we're gonna make it publicly available. Um, and we're doing everything we can to take the information that we're getting and making it publicly available. Um, arguably at a county level, trying to make information publicly available at a county level, nobody really has, has come back and, and had a lot of real heartburn with that. Um, but it comes back down to a lot of the information we're seeking just is not in a, in a format or a, a, a platform that allows us to share that out uh, um, publicly or even restricted uh, in the right circumstances. But we're doing our best. And, and, and I think that's the whole point of, uh, of, uh, of the lifeline discussion. County or city level, I feel like I'm, I'm reading this stuff in real time. Go to it. <laughs> that's, the, that's the challenge of real-time chat sessions. You know, you, you know, it's like you're trying to catch up with a Twitter feed here. That's right. It's like a ticker tape. Um, so I know we're kind of getting to the end here, and we want to be mindful of everyone's time. And I know we have some really good questions still coming in. And as I mentioned, uh, I think they're, they're bigger than just the last two minutes we have for discussion. So what we're going to do is we're going to work with our panelists to make sure that they are addressed and they are posted in, um, in the session materials. But um, I don't know about you all, but that was a really fast hour and a half. It just went incredibly quickly. Um, you all were incredibly engaged in the Q&A and the chat and very, very excited about that. I think it's just a testament to you know, the criticality of this topic, um, particularly as we ready for hurricane season. So, um, and as NAPSIG has and continues to engage with this community, it's clear that folks see the value in this construct and we hope that sessions like this help support you. And so while we did not get to all the questions posted, we didn't solve everything, we do hope um, that you will uh, stay tuned. You'll contribute to the survey that you see on um, the slide here. And then let us know, you know, what's working for you, what your challenges are, how can we work together? So this isn't just a, a great hour and a half of our time, but it's the stepping stone for some, some future work together. Uh, so please, you know, in your free time, I know not, we don't have a lot of that, please contribute to that when you can. So on behalf of Chris Vaughn, uh, I want, and NAPSIG, I wanna thank you uh, to our speakers one last time for sharing their work uh, with this goal of furthering uh, the community through sharing and learning from one another. So coming up next, our third and final session today will be on innovative data solutions for preparedness, response, and recovery. And one of our goals at NAPSIG has always been to help spread the word about available resources to our state, local, tribal, and territorial partners. And we know how busy you are, so we're excited to bring to you NearMap, Highfield, Here, and Esri to share their latest and greatest. So we hope to see you all back here at three Eastern time. And thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your time and for engaging and contributing to this amazing community. Thanks so much. Thank you.